So last time, we talked about this identity. It's the gross domestic product or national income identity, it's called. Gross domestic product is the sum total of all goods and services produced within a country during the course of a year. It's comprised of a combination of consumption, investment, government spending, exports minus imports. We talked at the end of class last time about why imports are subtracted off of this particular identity and some confusions that can come about uh, by virtue of that minus IM at the end of this identity. Today what we're going to do is we are going to focus our attention on the last two components. This is an international economics course, so we're going to focus our attention on exports and imports. And so let's get started doing that. Got a whole bunch of notes here. We're going to go through this step by step, but let's go back to this. So I want to define the balance of payments accounts. The balance of payments is a record of all international transactions that take place between residents of a country and residents in the rest of the world. It's defined in terms of residency rather than citizenship. That's a particular accounting point that's not too important to us, but, but for the record, that's, uh, that's a how, how in which we're um, keeping track of things. Now, balance of payments is broken down into two important sub-accounts. They are called the current account and the financial account, specified here in these two columns in the, in the table. The current account, in turn, has several different categories. So the current account, first of all, consists of all trades and transactions that, uh, that take place for goods. Uh, we sometimes call these merchandise goods. Anything essentially that can be put into a container, put into a box, put on a ship, shipped across to another country either by ship or by rail or truck is a good. And um, we measure the values of goods as they flow across the border both into and out of a country and we record all of those transactions on the balance of payments and the current account under the goods category. So that's the first item uh, that appears in the current account. The second account in the current account itself, sub-account, is called the services account. Um, so this consists of what I economists often refer to as invisibles. Uh, invisible trade is trade that can't be put into a container, can't be put onto a ship, does not consist of any visible uh, product that's being shipped. Services consist of things like insurance and transportation and legal services and medical advice and all sorts of things which tend to be provided by the movement of a person from one country to another, offering some advice, spending some time, uh, receiving a paycheck in return for that. Tourists who travel from one country to another country, um, engage and buy hotel services abroad, um, and vice versa. Those get counted in the services section of the balance of payments. Anytime individuals move, or if we transmit information across the internet, and provide advice or some sort of information or some sort of contract and then get paid for the services that we're providing a foreign entity, then that's going to be counted as a service on the balance of payments accounts. All right, so services trade, second important component of the current account. The third component of the current account is called income, and there are two versions of it. There's income payments and there are income receipts. Now. The, national, or the international balance of payments accounts have been revised and recategorized in the last couple of years or so. And so it used to be called just income payments and receipts, but now they're being classified as primary income. So primary income, income payments and receipts are synonymous with each other. And I'm using another, the AKA here means also known as. So also known as primary income and also known as profits. And this is a simpler way to think about what income payments and receipts happen to be. So profits consist um, a U.S. company owns an operation abroad, runs that operation abroad, produces a product, sells it, maybe abroad or maybe back in the United States, it doesn't matter, but it's running an operation and that operation is generating profits for the owners of the firm, which let's say are all located in the United States. When that profit gets pulled back and becomes a form of income to U.S. residents because of that foreign operation, we call it an income receipt. So it's profits being earned by a U.S. company that has operations or transactions being conducted abroad. Income payment, opposite of that. If a foreign firm is operating in the United States, earning income on that particular activity that's taking place here, that income or profit flows back to the foreign firm or to the foreign owners, we call that an income payment. 
All right, so income payments and receipts is basically the flow of profits on earnings by foreign entities operating abroad, moving in both directions into and out of a particular country. All right, so that's the third important category of the current account. Now, the fourth category is called unilateral transfers, or at least it used to be called unilateral transfers, also known today and also called secondary income. Now, unilateral transfers comprise two important categories, perhaps. Uh, one is remittances. So if an individual is working in a particular country and sends money home to their family on a regular basis, which happens quite often and in quite a substantial volumes, we refer to those as remittances. Now, it's a unilateral transfer because the money is flowing in one direction, but there's not an immediate exchange of something that's coming back in return, right? You're not getting anything in return for when you send your family money. You're just sending them money, and they can do with it what they will. But it's not a part of a this-for-that transaction that's taking place. Hence, this generates some problems for accountants who then have to figure out how to categorize these things. They put it into this account called unilateral transfers. Second important component of unilateral transfers is foreign aid or assistance. So if a natural disaster happens somewhere else in the world and countries respond by sending uh, money or goods or any kind of assistance to another country, not expecting anything in return, that also is a kind of a unilateral transfer. It would get incorporated in this part of the current account in the balance of payments. Yes? Does that include uh, if someone's working abroad and they send money to a private account? To their own, to their own account? Probably. So if you're a resident of another country, let's say, and you send money back and put it into your bank account that's located in, in the United States, let's say, then that would be like a payment from a non-resident to a resident in the United States. So I think it would get included. So if you're American working in Germany and you send money back to the States to your American bank account? I think it would be. I'm not positive of that, though. So don't take me at my word there. Uh, take that with a grain of salt. You have to be a resident of the other country, though, and that requires you to have spent some time there. If you just travel over there on business, and then you make some money and you send it back, and then you're not a resident, right. and so it wouldn't count as part of it. How the statisticians figure out and make the distinctions between those kinds of things, I don't know. I don't want to know. I'm just going to assume they do it well. All right, so that's the current account. Now, the financial account is an important other account that appears on the balance of payments, and it's the one that's kind of less talked about, but we're going to talk a lot more about the financial account, and you're going to learn a lot more about it than you may in other classes, perhaps. So the financial account is the flip side, and it's um, all transactions that take place for assets. And assets include the following types of, of items. Currency. So any kind of a trade, one currency for another country, uh, currency for between residents of different countries, you're going to record those transactions on the financial account side of the balance of payments. There's no good, there's no service, there's no profit being made on anything per se. It's just a pure transfer of one currency for another. There are assets being exchanged. If you take money from your bank account and you purchase a foreign stock issued by a foreign company, unless you're taking an ownership share in that foreign company, well, you're not buying a good, you're not buying a service, you're, not, you're buying an asset. So that asset transaction, currency for a stock, is going to get recorded entirely on the financial account of the balance of payments. If foreigners purchase bonds issued by companies here in the United States, borrowing money in order to finance an investment project, or if they purchase U.S. Treasury bills or bonds issued by the federal government, then those foreigners, foreigners are lending money to the government or to an individual firm and are purchasing an asset. The asset we can think of like a piece of paper that basically says U.S. government promises to pay you back this much principal plus interest according to the terms identified in this particular contract. You now own this piece of paper. It's an asset that's uh, redeemable for currency uh, based on the terms of that particular contract. Foreigner is acquiring an asset. A U.S. resident or the government is, is uh, acquiring money. It's an exchange of an asset for an asset. We would record that transaction on the financial account of the balance of payments. Any kind of bank deposits that are made. So a foreigner puts money into a U.S. bank and holds it here, or vice versa. We're going to record those transactions on the financial account. 
uh, any kind of a, loans, a loan that gets made by a bank or any kind of financial institution. So you go abroad, you're living there for some time, and you, or you're not living there, but you take out a loan in order to start up a business or you engage with a bank in that particular way, then it's going to get recorded on the financial account of the balance of payments. And lastly, any kind of real estate purchases, foreigners purchasing U.S. real estate or U.S. residents purchasing real estate abroad, vacation homes in the Caribbean, for example, any kind of transactions like that get recorded on the financial account of the balance of payments. All right, so that's a full listing of all of the things that might get accountable for and where we would put them, current account versus the financial account. All right, next. I want to talk about different types of trade balances or trade imbalances that we can describe and define. And here things start to get a little trickier, perhaps. So here's my slide on trade balances. <clears throat> First trade balance that we can define is called the merchandise trade balance, this one right up here at the top. I'm going to use the, uh, the, the variables TB just to refer to trade balance. And it's looking at only the balance on goods alone. So it's looking at a subcomponent of the current account and just picking out merchandise goods and saying, OK, how much merchandise did we export? How much merchandise did we import? And let's find the balance or the difference between those. Let's say exports of goods minus imports of goods, and we can define that difference as the trade balance. Or more specifically, we would call it the merchandise trade balance. Now, if that trade balance turned out to have a value greater than zero, we're going to say that the country has a trade or a merchandise trade surplus. If the value of TB takes on is negative, we have more imports than we have exports of goods in value terms, and we're going to say that the country has a trade deficit. Very simple and straightforward. So far, so good. Next, service balance. Service balance, as it indicates, is just the difference in services trade between the country and the rest of the world. So exports, oh, I've got G's there. That shouldn't be a G. That should be an S. Sorry about that. So service balance is exports of services minus imports of services. And if the service balance is greater than zero, we're going to say we have a service surplus. If it's less than zero, we're going to say we have a service deficit. Usually that transaction, that balance is rarely reported and rarely indicated as such. Uh, but just to be complete, I've included it. Next, we can talk about the goods and services balance. This is goods and services only. It's also known as net exports. So if you ever hear reported net exports with a country and the rest of the world, what they're most likely talking about is the balance on goods and services trade alone. Now remember, this is a subcomponent of the current account. We still haven't gotten to the full current account that's next. But if we wanted to talk about that balance and not say net exports, where we might think people might not know what net exports means exactly or what's included there, it would be more casually called the trade balance. Whereupon, you can now start to see that trade balance might get used for multiple different types of balances that might exist between a country and the rest of the world. All right, now, if this trade balance with goods and services is greater than zero, we would say we have a trade surplus, or we would say net exports is positive. Or if trade balance is, uh, TB is less than zero, we have a trade deficit, so we could say net exports are negative. Okay, so again, we're just doing terminology here and just getting a lay of the land. The last balance, current account. Now, the current account is going to include all of the categories that are incorporated in the current account. So I've got that listed as goods, services, primary, and secondary income. But because anybody reporting or talking about the current account balance is likely to think that readers will not know what the current account is, what should we call it shorthand? Let's call it the trade balance. So the current account balance might also get reported and described as a trade balance, as indeed it is. Okay, but the current account is equal to the exports of goods and services and income, that's the G and S and I, minus the imports of goods and services and income, where income is both primary income and secondary income. And if the current account is greater than zero, we should say we have a current account surplus, but we might say we have a trade surplus. And if current account balance is less than zero, we could say we have a current, we should say we have a current account deficit, but we might say 
We have a trade deficit. Yes. Just for quizzing purposes, if you say trade balance, should we assume that you mean current account balance? Mm, no, you should think about it and think about the context and think about what's being asked exactly and what would be the appropriate balance to use. Okay. Now, good question though, because kind of casually as I talk about and describe things in this class, I'm quite likely to kind of fall into the habit of just talking about the trade balance or the trade deficit. Usually when I talk about it, I'm going to want to include everything. So I'm going to really be talking about the current account deficit when I say trade deficit. But I want you to be aware that there are these distinctions and that different observers and writers might be picking data from different sources and using different definitions of what can reasonably be called different ideas of what the trade deficit or trade surplus could be defined as. And that's why you might see one person reporting a trade deficit that the U.S. has this year of one number, somebody else reporting it for the same year having a very different number, and you might say, well, how could they have such different numbers? Somebody's wrong. Well, probably neither of them are wrong, but instead they're using a different definition and describing it in the same way. So we've got to be really careful here and in many other places. There's lots of times where data is reported, and unless you ask like deep, more detailed questions, it's sometimes hard to know exactly what's being reported and, uh, and what's being measured there. So that's part of the things I want to insist upon and, and focus your attention on. I just have a follow-up question um, from that. Are we going to be um, figuring out the current account balance, or are we only interpreting them? Like, are we solving? You might need to. So you might skip data, and you might see exports and imports, and you might have goods, and you see services. There's some examples in the back of the, chap uh, the chapter sections that'll have questions like that. It'll give you some data for a hypothetical country and ask you to calculate, well, what is the um, trade balance, the merchandise trade balance? What is the current account balance? And we gotta figure out which of the items need to be included and which are not included. Okay, okay? so you should be able to do that, yeah. But any time that you'd say net exports, that would refer to just- Always goods, goods and services, services. yes. Okay. Now, there's a couple of things that there's two different ways, actually, in which we can define and measure the production that takes place uh, by a country. Okay, and the two terms are gross domestic product and gross national product. So I want to draw the distinction between these two different definitions of national income or national product. Both of them can be thought of as a measure of how much a country is producing. But they're slightly, they're defined slightly differently. So gross domestic product, as we defined uh, in our exercise last week, is equal to C plus I plus G plus exports minus imports. But more particularly, it's exports minus imports of goods and services trade alone. So it's net exports that's being added at the end of the gross domestic product identity. Now, that's the technical definition of how we would measure the gross domestic product. But the intuitive definition of GDP is that, as listed here, it's the value of all goods and services produced within the borders of the country. So by virtue of eliminating the income payments and, and receipts that are going back and forth between the countries, what gross domestic product is eliminating is, say, Japanese firms operating an assembly plant in the United States and earning income on that particular operation we would want to actually count that production as being produced within the borders of the United States, and we want to count that as part of GDP. So even though the income is going to accrue to a foreigner, we're going to count the production as being in the United States, therefore components and a part of gross domestic product. On the other hand, income that's earned by a U.S. citizen, national, but earned abroad in the rest of the world is not going to get counted as part of gross domestic product. And basically, by virtue of eliminating the income payments and receipts from the expression, only consisting of trade and goods and services, we are taking that into account. Okay? Now, gross national product. Gross national product is, intuitively, the value of all goods and services produced, within, uh, produced by U.S. nationals. Forget the within. I did this uh, just in the last 15 minutes before class. Sorry, I made some mistakes because I wanted to have a graphic of it instead of writing it out. Uh, so produced within by U.S. nationals. That is U.S.-owned factors of production, and here we don't care where in the world the production is taking place. 
So gross national product is going to incorporate by virtue of having the current account as the last expression over here. So this is exports minus imports, the current account balance we're including. The gross national product is going to include production by U.S. nationals on plants that are operated abroad and generating money for U.S. individuals. But it's going to exclude production taking place within the borders of the U.S. that happens to generate profits and returns to foreign nationals that happen to own and receive income on those particular operations. Okay? Now, for the U.S., the distinction between GNP and GDP is minuscule. It's almost nothing because income payments and receipts tend to be pretty close to each other, and we'll see that in just one minute. All right, so it's not a big deal, and it doesn't really matter which number we report for a country like the United States. But if you look at some other countries around the world, you'll note that some countries have an enormous amount of, say, foreign investment that they're taking and earning income on those foreign investments to a great deal. A lot of outward investment, not so much inward investment. And I haven't seen the numbers for this, but I'll pick out a country like um, Saudi Arabia, an OPEC country. A lot of oil income coming in, a lot of revenues being generated. What do they do with all the surplus money? They invest it often abroad. They have lots of external assets and they're earning income on those assets. But there's not so much flow of money into the country purchasing assets in the country, earning income in the opposite direction. So for a country like that, I suspect, though every time I give this lecture, I think to myself, I really should look this up and come and show the data, but I have not gotten around to that. <clears throat> so I suspect for a country like Saudi Arabia, or certainly some countries out there like that, you're going to find that GNP and GDP might be very different from each other. Now, which do you think is more important if we're trying to get at, say, a measure of well-being of <coughs> citizens within a particular country? Probably GNP, right? Because we're measuring that income earned by, by the country's nationals. It doesn't matter where they're earning it. They're earning income. They're making money. That would be a measure of well-being for the people. But we don't report GNP. We report GDP largely by convention. And largely, I guess, because there is some concern by some people in some circumstances. Maybe because you're concerned about, like, what is the ability to generate jobs within your country? How much production takes place within the border is going to be, it's going to matter to that kind of issue, that kind of question. It's not a huge issue, but it's one that you should be aware of. Yeah. What about a country like Switzerland, where a lot of <coughs> foreigners are actually investing in their banks? Would that like skew the GDP <coughs> to make it look like Switzerland has a lot more investment? Um, it's going to look like they have a lot of investment. They're going to have both inward and a lot of outward investment. And we're actually going to see that a little bit later tonight, because we're going to look at some data that's going to show that very phenomenon. Um, how much they make on it is going to be based on the fees that they earn, and the interest they earn on, um, by virtue of the money they're lending out and that they're using in the bank. So they act kind of like a bank. A lot of people <coughs> deposit money, but then they take that money and they invest it somewhere or they buy something so as to generate a return. And in the process, the banking system in Switzerland can generate income or revenue for itself. We're going to see today, too, that another country that does that in a huge way is Luxembourg. And you'll see why a little bit later in the class tonight. All right, let's take a look at some of the numbers, the actual numbers, yes. Okay, so this is on the BEA website, BEA.gov, and it's the balance of payment statistics or data that's reported for the United States in the year 2015, which is the last full year of data that we happen to have. Now, I don't need to memorize these numbers at all. I just want you to kind of see the values and the way in which it's set up. So we've got exports of goods and services and income receipts. That's the sum of this exports of goods and services. That's just the GNS exports. That's broken up into the goods itself and the services itself. So that's exports of goods. That's just exports of services. Then we have the primary income receipts, investment income and compensation of employees. But those are uh, basically the profits being earned. In the case of income receipts, we can think of this as being kind of like, an, I like to think of it as an export of a service. Because what you've got is somebody who's willing to take their capital or money, invest it in a business abroad, take the risk, offer entrepreneurial services or skills to try to get the business running and vibrant and generating income, and then is earning a return or a profit on the operations uh, by virtue of the fact that they're owning and controlling the operations from here. 
So you're exporting a service, entrepreneurial services I would call them, and receiving income in exchange for those services. Just like the export of another kind of service here, like an investment advice or banking advice or something like that. Okay, but we put it into another category. And then you've got the secondary income, which is the unilateral transfers that are taking place, in this case, in the receipt. So this would be in the inward direction. Now, imports of goods and services and income, same ideas with imports. It's broken up into its various categories, just like we laid out in the table before. Now, one quick discrepancy here. The capital account, it used to be probably 20 years ago plus. So if you do any readings that are dated to some degree and go back 20 plus years, you'll often hear people talking about the capital account in a country and talking about it as if it's very important and very significant. And if you look at our capital account here, it's a very small number, $42 billion or something out of um, money, uh, monies that go into the trillions of dollars here, right? So it doesn't seem like it should be that important. But when people long ago talked about the capital account, what they were referring to really is the financial account. Everything that's below the line here, financial account, is what used to be called the capital account. So understand that there's a little bit of a change in terminology over the years. Now, financial account is listed here, and we have U.S. acquisition of financial assets, this is hard to read, excluding financial derivatives, net increase in assets, $225 billion in 2015. So this is purchases of assets abroad by U.S. nationals, and it could consist of a couple of different things. One is U.S. nationals could be buying stocks abroad, could be taking ownership shares and opening companies, could be purchasing real estate abroad could be lending money to foreigners in one way or another. So a foreigner might come to a bank in the U.S., borrow money. That means we've made a loan to somebody abroad, and we could count it there as a U.S. acquisition of an asset abroad, and, and so forth. Oh, and also bonds. So if we purchase bonds issued by foreign governments or foreign companies, we would be lending money, if you will, and purchasing assets, pieces of paper that have value as a result of those transactions. And those would get recorded here on the financial account. Uh, we break it up into several categories. Direct investment is investment that's uh, greater than 10% ownership share in a particular company, so controlling, or at least a semi-controlling interest in an entity would get included there. Portfolio investment is more like bonds and stocks, which are shorter-term <coughs> investments made by mutual funds, pension funds, uh, things like that, and individuals. Um, and then other investment assets might include things like bank deposits, uh, just money that are deposited in checking accounts and savings accounts by uh, U.S. nationals abroad. And that gets incorporated there. And then reserve assets would be assets purchased or sold by the U.S. Central Bank, uh, foreign currencies or foreign holdings of stocks or bonds abroad. All right, question. How do they accurately assess like these investment assets? Well, one thing they do is they try to maintain and keep track of them on the basis of current market value for assets. So value, assets are changing their value all the time. Stock prices go up, they go down. Real estate prices go up or go down. Somehow, I don't know how, they try to keep track of the current value of these assets as they report them each year and each quarter on these particular accounts. Well, because if I open a bank account when I'm studying abroad in whatever country... Somebody's they, watching you. Yeah, they, how do they know <laughs> that I'm doing that? Uh, banks know? have reporting requirements, and so they have to report sort of holdings by foreigners and others in the bank in totals, kind of aggregate numbers, I believe. So they're going to pick up numbers in that particular way. I'm not sure how they collect a lot of this. And some of it they don't. And so they're going to make estimates or guesses based on kind of observed trends and knowledge that they have available. So some of this is not collected directly, but is kind of estimated or indirectly calculated. All right, now, I'm going to come down here and just at the bottom, sort of towards the bottom, we've got balances. And so just as a, in a nutshell, let's get a sense of what the balances are in some of these different accounts for the U.S. in the latest year. So the balance on the current account, minus $462 billion is how you would read that. And that means we have a current account deficit in the year 2015. We had it. Now, if you look on the balance on net exports, balance on goods and services alone, it's a little bit bigger at minus $500 billion. Not too much different, but a little bit bigger. 
Now look at the balance on just goods alone, merchandise trade balance. That's quite a bit bigger at $762 billion deficit. So now here you can start to see that you know, if, you're, if you're a journalist and you want to report on the trade deficit and you want to make it look like it's really, really big, well, which number are you going to pick? I'm going to pick the goods balance because it's a much bigger number and we can make a case that it's, it's very large. If you want to de-emphasize it, well, we could pick a different number. We could pick the balance on current account and we could say, no, it's not quite as bad. It's only $462 billion. Now, I'm going to give you arguments for why we might not want to care about what the value is and how big it is anyway. But if you did, just be aware that there are different balances you can pick and they might take on very different values in a particular year. And that's one reason why you might see one person report a trade deficit of $462 billion. You might see somebody else the same year report a trade deficit of 762 And you might wonder, well, why are we getting different numbers? Because they might be reporting something different. The balance on primary income, $182 billion. That plus the balance on secondary income of minus 144 is going to give us the distinction between gross domestic and gross national product. So we add these two together. I'm going to do it in my head and come up with about $40 billion, $38 billion maybe. And uh, that's going to be the difference in GNP versus GDP in the United States. It's only about $38 billion difference. Not very significant when we're talking about uh, $18 trillion on uh, the gross national product. Any questions before I move on to the next issue? Okay. Yes. Why did they switch from capital account to financial account? I don't I know. Part of it is part of it is standardization of terminology across different organizations around the world, and so you've got certain organizations that have started to kind of collect accounts and report them in a particular way. Other countries started it on their own and they reported things in a different way. And then what's happened over time is kind of we tried to standardize things. And we said, okay, well, we've been doing it this way, but the rest of the world or some international organizations have been recording things a different way, and it gets really hard to make comparisons when we're measuring it differently. So at some point, we kind of come together and say, tell you what, we're all going to get together and measure it the same way. And that requires some countries to change. So normally, the changes are taking place because of an attempt at kind of harmonization across different units across the world so that we can make better cross-country comparisons. It's uh, but we still have a category for capital. We do, and I um, have read two or three times what that actually means, and I can keep it in my head for about 30 seconds. Um, so I can't explain to you right now exactly what capital account means and why they've made that kind of important distinction or change in, in definition. All right, next. I'm going to actually jump to... An exercise in the, in the readings, hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at this, but I want to walk through this example pretty quickly, assuming that you have looked at it once, and if not, I'll go back and take a careful look at this again. This is in section 2.5 of the readings, reporting transactions on the balance of payments. And we're going to walk through a couple of exercises. What we do here in this example is walk through a hypothetical situation where, at the time, I suppose, a U.S. resident is exchanging $1,000 for 112,000 yen with a Japanese resident. And we're going to think about how those transactions would be recorded if they were recorded in a step-by-step -step kind of piecemeal fashion, each transaction being recorded independently. Now, we don't really record transactions like that. We don't look at every transaction. We look at summaries of transactions and net effects at the end of a period of reporting. And we see what the net effects are, and, those, and that's what gets reported. But, we can go back and we can do it in a step-by-step -step way and we're going to do it to illustrate an important principle about the balance of payments. Okay, so a U.S. resident exchanges $1,000 for 112,000 yen. The exchange rate here, obviously, is 112 yen per dollar. Now, you might say, well, we don't actually exchange with a Japanese resident. If I want to get yen, what I would do is I would go to the bank down the street and they would give me yen. I don't actually deal with a Japanese resident at all. Why do I have to make this kind of distinction? Well, actually, we are dealing with a Japanese resident when you do that, because the bank is serving simply as an intermediary. 
They're actually matching up the supply and demands of currencies going in the two directions on a particular day. They're equalizing that supply and demand by setting an exchange rate that will approximately equalize that. By doing that, individual banks are actually able to maximize their transactions fees or um, um, the benefits that they're getting by, by charging transactions fees, and that's what they're in the business of doing. They're making some money on all of the trades that they make for people and businesses, and you are dealing with another person in another country when you're exchanging your dollars for yen on a particular day. I've dropped out the intermediary here. We're imagining that it goes directly between two individual people. All right, when we record that, balance of payments are set up like a typical accounting ledger, the income sheet with credits and debits. And I am not an accountant, so I can't really translate this into the language of accountancy. I just remember a couple of individual tricks, if you will, or ways of doing things. So first of all, the way I keep track of things is anytime something is exported out of the hands of a U.S. resident and into the hands of another person abroad, the thing being exported is a credit entry. Anything that comes into the hands of a U.S. national, if we're looking at the U.S. balance of payments, of course, anything that comes into the hands of a U.S. national from a foreigner is going to be a debit entry. Any item that is a good or service or income payment and receipt is going to get recorded on the current account. Any item that is an asset of one sort or another is going to get recorded on the financial account. That's how we keep track of things. Now, the first trade is between dollar currency and yen currency. Both of those moving in and out of the country are assets. So both of them will be recorded as transactions or entries on the financial account of the balance of payments. The item being exported is actually the U.S. currency, which is going out of the hands of a U.S. resident into the hands of a foreign resident. We're going to mark the value of that U.S. currency at its current value, $1,000. So plus $1,000 credit entry on the financial account. Coming into the country, imported, is yen currency. But we're not going to measure it in yen terms. We're not going to say it's 112,000 yen. Instead, we're going to convert that at the current exchange rate to its equivalent in dollars, which is $1,000 worth. Eliminating all transaction fees, not accounting for anything like that. So minus 1,000, debit entry, financial account, that's the end of the transaction, and that's the end of step one. Step two, <coughs> let's imagine that the US resident takes the money, the 112,000 yen, and uses it to purchase a camera in Japan, thereby brings the camera back into his possession in the United States. Okay, we measure that transaction. First of all, what's being imported into the country? The item being imported is a good, it's a camera. The value of the camera is $1,000. Because it's a good, it's in the current account. Because it's imported, it's in the debit entry. So minus 1,000 camera, debit entry on the balance of payments. What's being exported? What's being exported is the yen currency, 112,000 yen in particular. But the current value, assuming no change in exchange rate, is still um, $1,000 worth. So we've got a plus 1,000 credit entry on the financial account. That's the two sides of the transaction now when the camera is purchased. Okay? Straightforward, I think. Step three. And here we're going to do step three in two different versions. We're going to do step 3A, and we're going to do step 3B. So in step 3A, the Japanese resident decides to take the dollars that have recently been acquired and purchase a computer in the United States. The computer is worth $1,000. The item being exported out of the U.S. market is a computer. It's a current account item because it's a good. It's a credit entry because it's being exported. So plus $1,000 computer listed here. The item being imported into the U.S. is an asset. It's U.S. currency coming back into the hands of the computer owner that's selling the computer. And that makes it a debit entry, and it's on the financial account of minus $1,000. All right? All right, now, what we might want to do, and is what statisticians would do, is not look at each individual transaction, but look at the net effect after all of these transactions have made and say, what happened over the course of these three transactions? Well, the summary statistics after steps one, two, and three will look something like this. We've got a $1,000 computer export. We've measured a $1,000 camera import. We've got plus $1,000 going out and plus 1,000 in yen going out. 
at one time or another. And we got $1,000 coming in, and we got 1,000 yen coming in at one time or another. Now, we could take those two, we could just net them out, because dollars ended up back where they started, the yen ended up back where it started. The only net effect, really, is that we've got a good worth of $1,000 being exported, a computer, and we've got a good worth of $1,000 being imported. That's the camera. So the net effect, we might say, is looks like this. The balance on the current account, we would say, and the balance on the trade balance, if we will, merchandise trade, is going to be plus 1,000 minus 1,000 equals zero. So therefore, balance on the trade, balance trade. And balance on the financial account as well, which is netted out to zero. Nothing very interesting. But we take step three and we change it to get the following scenario. <coughs> In step 3B, we imagine step 3A did not happen, but instead the Japanese resident is going to take the $1,000 that was acquired in step 1, and instead of buying a computer with it, we're going to imagine that the Japanese resident buys a U.S. savings bond or a bill or bond issued by the U.S. government. By virtue of doing that, what's going to happen is what's being exported from the country. What's being exported is a piece of paper. And it says, U.S. government promises to pay you back $1,000 plus interest according to the following terms and conditions. That's what's going into the hands of a Japanese resident. That thing is an asset, that piece of paper. They have a promise for repayment in the future. That's what they're holding on to, and they're going to hold that for, uh, to hold on to value. So it's a credit entry. It's a financial account entry because a piece of paper that says IOU on it is an asset, not a good or a service. The debit entry is $1,000. It's coming back into the country when the, the Japanese resident is essentially lending money now to the U.S. government and is getting a promise to have that money repaid at some point in the future. All right. So that's all that's happened. Now, step one, currency traded. Step two, U.S. Um, resident buys a camera in Japan. Step three, Japanese resident takes the dollars they acquired and purchases a bond issued by the U.S. government. Let's calculate summary statistics after steps one, two, and three, 3B. Well, now on the current account, we don't have any kind of an export, right? Nothing's been exported in terms of goods or services, but we still have the $1,000 camera import. On the financial side, we've got a bunch more transactions. We've got the currency going out and coming back in. We've got the yen currency coming in and going back out. Those are going to cancel out, and the net effect is going to look exactly like this. Now we've got current account, zero ex exports, $1,000 imports. Financial account, $1,000 exports, zero on the imports on the financial account. So $1,000 worth of assets were exported from the country, a zero worth of um, assets were imported into the country, net. All right, when we calculate the balances, though, and say, what is the balance on the current account? We would say exports minus imports is equal to minus $1,000. We now have a trade deficit. Financial account, 1,000 minus, minus zero gives us a positive $1,000 on the financial account. We would say we have a financial account surplus. Balance on the financial plus the balance on the current in both of the scenarios equal to zero, right? And that always has to be true. It's not an economic theory. It is an accounting identity, like here. The balance on the current account plus the balance on the financial account have to equal zero, as long as all transactions are accounted for properly. Yes? What about the interest? Interest is going to get recorded on the current account, because interest is payment for a service that's been rendered, and so it's a service entry. So all interest <coughs> payments are going to get recorded on the, on the services side of the current account. It'll get included somehow. We just kept it out for simplicity. Yeah? I'm confused, like, so what, hypothetically, in our, like, example, what if the Japanese guy, like, didn't buy a U.S. bond, he bought a bond for, in France? Okay, so in France, do they issue bonds in, denominated in U.S. dollars? Not in dollars, but you could transfer it. Ah, oh, but if you transferred it, who are you going to trade with? Okay. And if you traded with somebody else because you wanted to buy a euro bond instead, then what's that person going to do with that money? The dollars that they just acquired? Buy them in. The only reason to get dollars is because you want to do something in the U.S. economy. Okay. 
right? So you could go to that third country, but there's going to be somebody else involved, and they're going to either come back and buy a good, and we're in scenario one, or they're going to come back and they're going to buy a bond, and we're in scenario two. Okay. So it's got to work out that way. Question? Yes. But net exports, that's uh, for the current account, right? Net exports is for net for, exports for is a component service. of the current account. For the goods and services that gets back to the GDP. Yeah. That's the current account. Now it's a part of the current account. So when we're talking here, we're talking about current account, not the net export term. <coughs> So we've got to also include the income payments and receipts and unilateral transfers when we're doing this identity. We can't plug in the balance on net exports here and have it sum to anything because we've got those, those income payments and receipts or those income that's going back and forth. All right, so we've got to keep track of what, what trade balance we're incorporating here. Right. It has to be the current account. My question is um, if you have a trade deficit on the current account, and a trade surplus on the financial account, the deficit would get factored into the GDP? Yeah, let's say there's no income transfers whatsoever. Then there's a deficit on current account, you said? Right. And that deficit in current account is going to show up in the GDP identity, just Even like that. Even though there might be a surplus in the financial account. Absolutely. That would not be <coughs> That doesn't get incorporated. It's already... What we need to measure on the national income identity is there. We don't need extra stuff from the financial account. This is another identity looking at another set of relationships that are true out there. Right. All right. There's some overlap, but not 100% overlap. Now, interpretation is important here because the simple story tells us a lot. What the country is doing is actually acquiring an extra good from abroad. It's getting an import of a good. But in order to finance that good, in this first scenario, we finance the purchase of the camera from Japan by selling a computer of equal value. That's how the computer, from a national perspective, got financed. Now, that's not what happened from the individual's perspective, because they're just doing their own thing. When we aggregate it all together and think about it from the national perspective, that's what's taking place. First scenario is the camera is being financed by selling a computer of equal value. In the second scenario, though, the camera purchase is being financed by borrowing money from somebody abroad. They've decided to put their money into an account in the United States, save it here for a later period when they're going to draw it back. And by virtue of them saving that extra money in the US economy, we were able to acquire that camera from abroad. All right, so current account deficits can be interpreted in one instance as an instance of borrowing money from the rest of the world. So to the extent that the financial account surplus corresponds to IOUs, debt, that's being issued by the trade deficit country, current account deficit country, we can interpret it in that particular way. Okay, so a trade deficit could mean we're borrowing money from the rest of the world in order to finance that trade deficit. I say trade really mean current account. But there's another way to interpret and another way to think about this. Suppose that our Japanese resident in the second step didn't buy a U.S. savings bond, but instead purchased real estate. I don't know where you're going to get real estate for $1,000, so let's make it a million dollars instead. Okay, purchased real estate for a million dollars. Okay, well now, how did we acquire a million dollars worth of goods on the import side to run a trade deficit of, say, a million dollars? Well, in the second instance, we're able to achieve that extra import of goods, and we finance it by basically <coughs> selling off some of our country. We sell off a part of a business, we sell off some real estate, we give ownership of it to a foreign entity and say, you can have ownership, you can earn any returns that come from that property in the future, it's yours. So we sell an asset to a foreigner, and that enables the country to import a million dollars extra goods and services that we don't pay for with the export of a good. That always, 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 always has to be taking place in a country that's running a trade deficit. It's got to be either borrowing or lending or the sale of assets, which is the counterpart on the financial account, 
which has to offset any and all trade deficits that occur on the current account side. This balance on current plus balance on financial has to be true all the time. Now, that's going to lead us to a quick and simple conclusion. A lot of people think that running a trade deficit is kind of unfair in some way. You know, and they'll kind of allude to the fact that, you know, we're importing all these goods from the rest of the world and they're not buying anything from, they're not buying as much from us. We can't sell them goods. We're, we're buying their goods. They're not buying our goods. It's not fair. Well, actually, there is complete balance on the balance of payments all the time because what they're not buying from us, they are giving to us back in the form of asset purchases. They're either lending money to some entity in the United States or they're purchasing U.S. assets, real estate, or businesses, or stocks issued by companies. So that has to be taking place on the flip side. We're not losing any money as a result of running trade deficits. All the money is coming right back into the United States because it doesn't make sense for anybody outside the U.S. to hold on to dollars and not do something with them. Although in today's day and age, with the interest rates so low, Maybe it does make sense to hold on to them. And I will also point out that sometimes people would like to have a currency that they trust and is going to continue to hold on to its value in a country where there might be inflation or even hyperinflation. And so sometimes you may know that U.S. currency actually does circulate outside the country to a certain degree. But it's not very much. And it doesn't actually change the way in which we would measure the balances on these two accounts. Now, let me go back to the data that I wanted to talk about, and I realized I was stuck because I didn't present that particular point. Let's go back to the actual balance of payments data for just a minute. And I want to point out that if we look at the balances here, we see that the balance on current account is minus $462 billion. And we come down here and we look at the balance, this last balance, this net lending and borrowing, is minus $195 billion. That is actually the recorded balance on the financial account in 2015, minus 195. And the recorded balance on the current account in 2015 is 462. Now, the way they're doing the accounts now is kind of messed up because the minuses and pluses don't mean the same thing as I've just reported to you. But there's a difference between these two numbers and they're supposed to be identical. The 462 is supposed to be equal to the value that this shows up over here in order for the balance on the current plus the balance on financial to be equal to zero. In actuality, when we do the numbers, it doesn't work out that way. So, two possibilities. The theory is wrong. Not possible because it's not a theory. It's an accounting identity. What matters in the end is that last caveat at the bottom of the expression. The balance on current plus balance on financial always equals zero as long as all transactions are accounted for properly. The fact that they're not means we're missing something. We're not measuring everything that's out there, and we do the best we can, and we add up all the numbers on the current account side and the financial account side, and we add it all up, and we say, do they equal each other like they should? And the answer is no. We were <coughs> off by $267 billion in 2015. That's the amount by which, at the minimum, we missed transactions somewhere. Yeah. How can the discrepancy be that big? Like if this is what we well, do all the time, how can it how can they be that far off? Let me go back. We can modify this this data here. And let me just go back and show a couple of extra years. Or is that like a normal Yeah, I, that's why I I don't know if it's offhand because let's look at the annual data and we'll see what it comes up with. So we'll refresh the debt table here and look at the statistical discrepancy over the past few years. So $267 billion in 2015, it was 104 the year before, it was minus 24 the year before that, it was only minus, minus $917 billion in 2012, 54. So this year was especially bad. But the size of the number is not actually indicative of the true error that's being, that's being rendered there. Because all you're doing is you're adding up these debits and credits, and you're finding that debits and credits are missing each other last year by $267 billion. Now, it could be you just missed $267 billion on one side, and that's why they don't add up. But it could be you missed 
let's add a big number. You missed one trillion two hundred sixty-seven billion dollars on one side, and you missed one trillion on the other side. Both sides of which could be on the current, could be on the financial, they could be anywhere. You don't know where they were because you missed them. So it could be the error is much, much bigger than that. We don't know, because if we did know, we would have put them in here and the number would have been smaller. <coughs> now, this leads us to another conclusion that you should all be aware of. Data is not facts. The data is not, oh, this is the way it is. We know this is the way it is. No, data is estimates of the facts. The data of the national income accounts is an estimate of what it is we're producing in a particular year, and this is a good indicator that we don't get the number perfectly correct all the time. Now, hopefully, however we're wrong, we're wrong in a systematic way year after year, so that the changes that take place year after year are indicative of what's really happening. But quite honestly, we can't be sure of that. We don't know for sure. And you should all be aware that the data has inconsistencies and that it's just really, really hard to measure all of this up across an entire economy and expect to have complete accuracy. And we don't. Um, we do the best we can, but that's not perfect. Yeah. This is probably obvious, but are some countries more accurate than others? Presumably, like, yes. Switzerland would have much more sophisticated measures than I mean, the country. I mean, you know, the developed countries have been doing this for a long time. Every year they're putting in new adjustments and they're constantly thinking about how to measure things better. They're always thinking about corrections. Periodically, they will go back to the national income accounts, for example, and they'll update it and they'll make substantial changes to the way in which they're accounting for things, the way they measure things, and they'll change it in a particular year. But they realize that everybody wants to know how it compares to the past. And you can't change the measurement this year without looking at the data 10 years ago and saying we better readjust the data to fit with the new definitions. So a lot of times they'll go back and they'll revamp all of the data going all the way back in time and they'll say based on this new definition, this is what the numbers would have been you know, back in 1945. And they'll do a complete revision like that. Even the data that gets reported on GDP growth, for example, it gets reported one month at the end of a quarter. And you should notice that when they first report it, it will be a preliminary data. And then one month later, they're going to report again the data for that same period, and it's going to be a different number. And then a few months later than that, about six months down the road, they're going to report another number, which is going to be a new revision, again, based on more information coming in and hopefully a better accounting for what's actually happened during that period. So the first report you get, which is usually the only one you ever hear, unless there's a significant change later, often is not the final number that's going to be ultimately recorded and reported in the long term. It's also why you could look at a series of data today, get down the numbers for, say, 2010, here's what GDP was in 2010, and I can go look at it two years later, and the same data from the same source will report a different number than what I got two years ago from some point in the past because of these revisions that have taken place along the way. I don't know what to do about that, uh, except to report to you that it is like that and to be conscious and cautious in the way in which you talk about and use data. Was there a question? Uh, is there a possibility that I, any one of the conflicts could overlap to the other, like one forms with the current account and the financial account? For example, real estate. When you're dealing with real estate as an asset, there could also be a component of service involved. Uh, service? Service, like legal accounting, legal service. Or yeah, basically you're going to want to take a transaction like that and you're going to have to break it down into its various subcomponents. So you've got the value of the real estate itself, but then you've got the services provided for by the realtor in terms of showing and making the transactions. You've got the legal services and stuff. All of that is going to get accounted for in different accounts on the balance of payments, presumably, when you're, when you're making those particular transactions. So is there a chance that if you miss on any of that, that could also have an impact on your calculations? Yeah, I mean, you've got to get all of that reported in some way. I don't know how they aggregate those and get those reported. We'll say the following, though. In terms of what we measure, there are things that we probably measure better than other things. And one of the things we can measure pretty accurately, probably, is goods trade. Merchandise goods, it's put into a container, it shows up at a port, and has to be declared. 
Now, we can stop one second and say, well, wait a minute, are we sure that the declarations are always accurate and that, you know, do we check? Do we make sure that when they say this container has $1.5 million worth of widgets in it, do we actually check to make sure there's $1.5 million worth of widgets? What if we report something different? Well, we don't know. We only can go on what's being reported. But those reports are checked, and we do do investigation sometimes, and we do stop people and say we're going to check the value if we think it's suspicious. And so there's checks and balances in place, and we probably measure those goods trade pretty well over the course of a year. But when you get into any kind of the services transactions that are taking place or the income payments going back and forth, maybe through third countries and through other accounts, when we talk about the financial account side, that's where things get a little bit harder to nail down and be sure that you're catching everything, I think. So some accounts are probably measured more accurately than others, and that's the way it is. Let's take a look at the financial account side of this for a minute. And I want to highlight the fact that what we're recording on the balance of payments, I want to draw the distinction between flow variables and stock variables. Okay, a flow variable is a change in, a, in an item that takes place during the course of a year. Income is a flow variable. It's how much money does one earn per year. A stock variable is something that exists at a point in time. So a stock variable with respect to a household, for example, might be the household's net worth. What is the sum of all of their assets, the sum of all their liabilities, the difference between the two is the net worth, and you can calculate a person's net worth at an instant in time. This is what the values are right now. This is what your net worth is right now, not over a period of time. So that's a stock variable. Something that's measured over a period of time is a flow variable. The balance of payments, exports, imports, what's appearing on the financial account are all measured per year. So we're looking at the flow of these items over the course of the year. Now, let's take a look at things like assets and the, on the financial account side of things. The asset flows that we're recording on the balance of payments are changes in positions that are taking place during the course of the year. So if somebody goes out and purchases new real estate abroad, and takes ownership of that real estate, the transaction takes place in 2015, then we're going to record the value of that import of an asset by U.S. national in 2015. Somebody abroad purchases an asset here, it's going to get recorded on the financial accounts of, the, of that particular year. Same thing with borrowing and lending. If any new borrowing or lending takes place, any new bonds are purchased or sold during the course of the year, we're going to get recorded as a flow a change in the positions that are taking place in that particular year. It's kind of like from a national perspective, when a country runs a deficit, and we think about the fact that a deficit corresponds to a financial account surplus, and the financial account surplus could be represented by a borrowing of funds from the rest of the world, right? We could think of it as if a country kind of has a credit card for the rest of the world and is going out to the rest of the world and charging an extra amount of money that corresponds to the surplus on the financial account, right? But that's just the amount of money that's being borrowed in that year. If you look at a household, you might be able to calculate, well, how much did they add to their credit card balance during the course of a year? That's how much they borrowed during the course of that year. But as anyone who's got a credit card that doesn't pay it off every month knows, that credit card <coughs> borrowings in a particular year, they can add up if you don't pay it all off. And how much you have to pay back might be very different than the amount that you've actually borrowed during the course of a year. Now, the balance on a credit card is a stock variable. There's a fixed amount of money that has to be repaid at some point in the future according to the terms and conditions of the contract, and you're liable for that. The same thing is true at the international <coughs> level when we're talking about a country and its financial accounts on the balance of payments. The financial accounts are recording flows of assets in a particular year. It might be very useful and instructive to know what the stock of assets are 
between one country and another that have accumulated over time. So we buy more real estate abroad this year, and next year we buy some more real estate abroad, and the next year we buy some more real estate abroad as a country in the aggregate, different individuals making the transactions. How much do U.S. citizens own of all of that real estate abroad? How many bonds in total do the U.S. residents own abroad? How much um, stocks and ownership of company shares are owned by U.S. residents abroad? and vice versa. How much do foreigners own here in the United States? Now, we have a record of all of that. <coughs> and it is called the International Investment Position. So we're going to take a look. And what it's doing is really it's taking all of these categories in the financial account that we just described and talked a little bit about, and it's summing them up across the entire history of the United States, essentially. And saying, let's look at the flows that have taken place both inward and outward, and let's aggregate them to find out what the stock is of assets owned abroad and assets owned here. International investment position. And just like you can't really judge a financial health of a household by just knowing how much they borrowed on their credit card during the course of a year, you need to know what their balance is as well. So for a country, knowing what a country's trade deficit is is in some ways not quite as important as knowing what the total balance is relative to the rest of the world. So let's take a look at it. If we go, I'll show you real quick, if we go to the BEA site and go to international right here, it gives you international economic accounts. If you go to international transactions, interactive tables, that's this one, you get to international data. All right. Um, Gives you three different things here. International transactions, that's the balance of payments. International services, I don't know what that is. International investment position, that's what we want. I've got it open over here. Okay, the U.S. net international investment position at the end of the period, that is at the end of the first quarter, 2016 is the latest data we have. This is a stock variable, so what matters is what we have at the end of a particular point in time. Um, Let's look at U.S. assets first, this number. U.S. assets mean ownership of assets by U.S. residents or citizens abroad. So if a U.S. citizen owns a piece of property abroad, we're going to count it as a part of the total U.S. asset. <coughs> if U.S. mutual funds have ownerships in foreign stocks, we're going to count that as part of U.S. assets. If U.S. citizens or banks have lent money to foreigners, then we have a claim on the returns on money from those foreigners in the future. We have a piece of paper, a contract, that says the foreigner is going to pay us back some money in the future. So that's an asset. We have that asset. So lend money abroad, it's going to get counted as part of U.S. assets. Um, hold on to foreign currency, hold on to a foreign bank account, we're holding a foreign asset. It's going to get counted as U.S. assets held abroad. Some total of all of those assets in 2016, first quarter, is 24 trillion dollars. So bigger than the gross domestic product of the United States. Total value hold, held abroad is 24 trillion dollars. Now let's break it down by functional category because that's a little bit more interesting. Direct investment at market value. So direct investment, ownership share more than 10% in companies, seven trillion dollars worth of companies' assets are owned by U.S. citizens or U.S. residents. Seven trillion dollars worth of companies. All of those companies are generating income and returns to the shareholders, <coughs> stockholders, the owners of those particular companies here in the United States. Not non-government. Mostly non-government, I would think, here. But it, uh, uh, this is incorporating all government and private transactions and holdings together. So if there's any government holdings of direct investment, I don't know if there are. There might be. But uh, if there are, it would be incorporated in there as well. Portfolio investment. Well, portfolio investment is going to be less than 10% ownership share. It's going to be both securities like bonds, but it's also going to be stocks. It's both debt and equities, and it amounts to almost $10 trillion worth of holdings of portfolio investment abroad. Financial derivatives, that would be you know, something like a mortgage-backed security as a, as a financial derivative, and so they separate those out and, um, and account for them separately. 
Other investments are going to include things like just deposits and bank accounts and such, about $4 trillion. Add it all up, it comes to $24 trillion worth of assets owned by U.S. residents abroad. Other side, U.S. liabilities. This is what we owe to foreigners, have to give them back in the form of IOUs, we have to pay back loans or purchases of U.S. real estate and businesses by foreigners. It has amounted to $31 trillion at the point in time, first quarter 2016. Okay, again, functional categories. Biggest component of that is uh, the portfolio investment at $16 uh, trillion worth. $16 trillion is the portfolio investment um, by foreigners in the United States. <coughs> uh, direct investment at $6.6 trillion, which, by the way, is not very far off from U.S. investment abroad, $7 trillion. So investment flows in direct investment terms is pretty equal in and out of the country. But the portfolio investment is big, and this is going to include things like foreigners' purchases of U.S. Treasury bills and bonds issued by the U.S. government. So the U.S. wants to borrow money, they issue a bond. They get money from, the, um, from somebody uh, and use it to finance the deficit spending and promise to pay back at some point in the future. In the, in the meantime, somebody abroad is holding on to a bond that says U.S. government promises to repay some amount in the future. And that's part of this $16.9 trillion worth. All right. Yes? Isn't that a good – I mean, a, a show of confidence, though, in a government if they have a significant uh, amount of – Portfolio investments abroad. I mean, why do people want to buy <laughs> assets in the United States? We could argue because the U.S. economy is healthy and they expect to make a return on those particular assets. Maybe they buy more here than we buy abroad because the prospects of asset increasing in value and generating a return and being safe might well be better in the United States than it is in their own country or that we see in, in investing our funds abroad. So yes, it could indeed be interpreted as a sign of confidence in the economy that so many foreigners wish to purchase <coughs> assets in the United States. It's interesting to see the size, and I don't know if you would have realized, it was $31 trillion worth of holdings by foreigners in the United States. It's a pretty big number. Is there a, a graph or a good data um, sheet, kind of like what we were looking at with, for the GDP with yeah, we're going to take a look at this with respect to um, uh, GDPs in the U.S. We'll look at some other countries as well to kind of see how to compare. Because this is one of these examples. I could show you these numbers and then stop. And then you go away and you go, what's 31 trillion? I don't know what to make sense. How do I make sense of that? How does it compare with other countries? Unless you've got some way to compare it, a lot of times data presentation is meaningless. So it's important to kind of put it into context. We're going to do that. Last thing I want to show here. Question? Oh, yeah. So... Since it involves international trading, like, uh, doesn't like the exchange rate uh, affect the uh, data? Like, um, so if uh, the data is changing because the exchange rate is changing, not because of the value of the assets. <coughs> so, what I'm trying to say is, the data we're going to take that into account, and we're actually going to calculate it from the internal vantage point, taking exchange rate changes into account. So when they do the updates each year. They're going to take account of changes in valuations that are going to arise because of exchange rate changes between the U.S. and all of the other countries where money is invested and vice versa. Okay, so it's going to get incorporated, and it means that we could get a change in our net position entirely, not because there's been any more trades taking place, but entirely because of an exchange rate change that occurs between the U.S. dollar and foreign currencies. So it will get incorporated there, and they will take account of that. Yeah. Does that include both? Uh, personal holdings, personal foreign holdings of U.S. domestic assets and government FDI as well? Yes, so we're looking at this from a national perspective. Every domestic group and foreign group is incorporated. So it's government, private, everything combined is incorporated here. And so, and when we interpret it, we have to think about it in terms of not, it's the country in a sense. And there is nobody controlling all of these things in the country, directly at least. Now, the net effect, the net position on our international investment position is minus $7.5 trillion. And if we think about this in terms of IOUs, debt only, one way to interpret that is, in essence, that the U.S. owes on net 
$7.5 trillion in repayment to the rest of the world. Like if we cashed in all of this money tomorrow, we're going to be expected to pay an extra $7.5 trillion out to foreigners in the rest of the world in order to make good on these particular holdings. We're in debt, we could say, to the tune of $7.5 trillion net as a nation. And for that reason, we would say that the United States is a debtor country, D-E-B-T-O-R. U.S. is a debtor nation. If the number were positive, we would call the country a creditor nation. So we don't use the term deficit and surplus here. We use debtor versus creditor. Now, the $7.5 trillion is bigger than any other country in the history of the world. That net position is bigger than anybody. So it's correct to claim that the U.S. is the largest debtor nation in the world. We owe more money to the rest of the world than any country, probably almost every other country combined. It's big. How to put this in perspective? Well, we've got to relate it to something that might be like the size of the country. And the size of the country that we have, we don't have the total assets of the country, so we can't look at it in that vantage point, but we do have the national income of the country, which is about $18 trillion. So we can put this as a percentage of national income, and the number comes out to be a little over 40% of national income. But if we had to pay off tomorrow, we're going to have to fork over 40% of our national income to the rest of the world in order to make good on the amount of excess that's owed to them. Question in the corner here. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, I I get all the facts part, but, like, is there an opinion that's attached to everything that you just said? Like, a little bit, yeah. We're gonna, and we're going to get to interpretation okay. and how to understand this a little bit more. Okay. First, just the data and kind of to see what's out there. Now, i to go back to... So here's some perspective. Uh, what was that, 7.5? So this number I have here for 2015, that was as of the first quarter of 2016. So it's risen another $200 billion or so since the end of 2015. Net IIP, $7.3 trillion here. Total assets and liabilities, much like we recorded and reported just a second ago. Net IIP, minus 41% of GDP. Total assets and liabilities also as a percentage of GDP, 129% and 170% respectively. <coughs> All right, so that just is where we are at the moment. Now, let's go back a few years in time, which is what we've got listed here, to see how things have changed. And you'll notice that our net IIP is up to 7.3 or 7.5. Go back to 2010, it was only $2.4 trillion. So just in six years, it's gone from a net 2.5 to a net $7.5 trillion. That's a pretty sizable and significant increase in net IIP from about, also, 17% of GDP in 2010 up to 41% of GDP, almost doubled. So one thing we can look at is the trend, and maybe this is a worrisome trend. We're going to come back and evaluate this a little bit more next time in class. All right, but we have a trend decidedly upward and doubling in, in total size over the course of the last um, six years only. If we go back in time a little bit further, you'll notice that um, this number falls until it actually turns over and becomes positive back in the 1980s. And in fact, the changeover was uh, right here between 85 and 86. It was in that period that we turned from being a creditor nation, which we were in the United States from all of the post-World War II period up until 1985, to becoming a debtor nation. And then the debt continued to rise significantly up until the $7.5 trillion that we're at today. The other thing to notice from this data is to note how the size of assets flowing in both directions have increased since um, 30 years ago or so. 30 years ago or so, we were looking at total asset holdings of 34 and 24 percent respect, respectively out of GDP. Today, 129 and 170 percent of GDP. So this is a good indication of the expansion of international finance that has taken place over the course of the last 30 years, and especially, you might say, even in the last 10 or 15 years. Because there's been a pretty substantial increase from the early 2000s to where it is today. 
So a big increase in international finance, lots of assets being bought and sold internationally, financial concern. This is one of the reasons why investment companies have grown so big and why they've taken on so much of a bigger role and seem to be more important. The amount of transactions have increased considerably. All right, some other perspective. And here I'm going to go back. This is the data for Europe, European countries. And it goes back to um, 2009. I don't have the updated data here. But that's OK. It's going to give us something to look at. So 2009. And remember, for the US, around 2009, our net IIP was about 17% of GDP. It is always better to look at as a percent of GDP on these data because that gives you some measurement or some comparison to kind of the ability to repay, if you will. It's kind of a measurement relative to the income, and so it tells you something about how big of a debt the country happens to be in. So here, let's look at the euro area first to note that uh, their IIP in 2009 was about the same as it was in the U.S., about $2 trillion worth. This is the euro area combined, and uh, their assets and liabilities were also comparable in size, and their IIP was very similar at minus 17% assets and liabilities in a similar range. Okay, but if you look at individual countries, you'll see some important differences. Germany, for example, is a creditor country. Net IIP of 38%, assets and liabilities over 200% in assets, but they are a creditor nation, meaning if anything, they have lent money to the rest of the world, or they have net purchases of assets from abroad relative to internal purchases in Germany. Same thing is true for Belgium, creditor country. Netherlands, a creditor country. Look at Luxembourg, and this is the number I had alluded to before. I had a research assistant put these numbers together, and they went out and collected the data from the IMF, came back and showed me the 12,000% assets and 12,000% liabilities, and I thought, no, oh, that can't be right. So I sent them back to calculate the numbers again, came back and said, no, no, no that's right. 12,000% of GDP are their assets holding abroad, and 12,000% of their GDP is their liability. <coughs> Pretty close. Net effect is 85% of GDP. What this indicates is that Luxembourg is a bank. What do banks do? Banks take deposits in, those are their liabilities, and they make loans out to the rest of the, you know, to the community. Those are their assets. Assets and liabilities are very, very big for a bank, and what they make money on is the interest payments that are coming in, the net effect. They pay money for the deposits, they get money back from the loans they're making, they make a little bit of income. Income of a bank is gonna be way down here, total assets of the bank are gonna be way up here. That's what Luxembourg is doing. A lot of money flowing in, being deposited into their banking system, a lot of money being lent out, and they're making some money on the transactions that are taking place. Luxembourg is a bank. <coughs> Not very many people there, but there's a lot of inflows and outflows. Look at um, what other countries have bank-like characteristics. Ireland. Ireland. I never really realized that Ireland was quite so financially connected to the world as they had become in the last 20 years or so. But Ireland had become like a bank. Look at their IIP as a percentage of their GDP in Ireland in 2009. 103% of GDP is their net what they owe to the rest of the world. Now, 103% is a substantial amount, and it is much, much bigger than 40% that we have today. It's also much bigger than the 17% that we were suffering from, if you will, to use that term maybe inappropriately, but suffering from back in 2009. Okay, this is indicative of some countries that are in great difficulty. Look at Greece in 2009, minus 89%. You know Greece is in trouble. They've been in trouble for a long period of time. They've got problems repaying their external debt. Their debt is too high, and I'll bet by now, Greece's external debt is probably 150% of their GDP. As their GDP has fallen and their net obligations continue to grow, okay, Greece is in a very difficult, uh, difficult period, and as they make repayments of these, their standard of living is being reduced substantially and their growth of GDP has been abysmal. Their unemployment rate is ridiculously <coughs> high. Greece is a good example of a country with external debt problems that have become extremely severe in terms of the effect that it's having on its own economy. 
And Greece is the kind of country where you can look at what's happening and say, oh my gosh, they're in this problem because of debt, excessive debt. Next, we move over to the United States and remember that the US is the largest debtor nation in the world. We can go back in time, we can think of lots of episodes in the past where Latin American countries, Mexico, other countries have been in external debt problems where they've had difficulty repaying their obligations to the rest of the world and have had to suffer a dramatic decline in their standards of living in order to make that happen. We might ask, is the United States in a similar precarious situation? Well, the first and foremost thing to note is, at least in terms of our net international investment position, 40% is in that range of maybe getting worrisome. It's getting large, it's growing fast, but it's not 89 or 113 or 103% of GDP. When you get into that range, you're in a much, much more worrisome situation and have to worry about how you're gonna pay that back out of your income flows in the future, especially if economies are stagnating or if unemployment is high and you're not growing at the rapid paces like countries were growing back uh, pre-financial crisis in 2008. All right, so this gives a little bit of perspective on how to compare the United States with these other countries. And we're gonna come back next time and we're gonna talk a little bit in more detail about how to interpret trade deficits and surpluses in terms of the borrowing and lending that's taking place and especially in terms of long-term scenarios and how they might play out. All right, so that's the topic of next uh, week's lecture. This is just to get us started and to understand uh, definitions of terms, and definitions of things that we're gonna to have to use in order to make sense of our trade situation with the rest of the world. There's one more identity, aggregate macro identity that I want you to know something about, and it is called the twin deficit identity. <clears throat> so I'm gonna to go to the textbook here just to show you a couple of charts very quickly. The twin deficit identity is an aggregate or macro identity, much like the national income identity. It's an accounting relationship that if we account for all of these flows properly, they have to add up in the way in which I'm gonna to present to you at the end here, what I call the twin deficit identity, or what is called that. Now, it can be derived by looking at a series of diagrams here, which is demonstrating the flow of money through an economy, and this is a, series of diagrams that increasingly complicate uh, the nature of the economy. So in a very simplest sense, we can just imagine of a simple economy that consists of just a bunch of people living in households or families and a bunch of firms that are producing goods and services. <coughs> there is no other entities to concern ourselves with. And what happens in a very simple sense is firms produce goods and services by using workers who come in and produce it. The firms sell the products on the market to the consumers who actually acquired income from the firms by working for them. The money then flows from firms to the workers to pay them their income. The households use that income to buy the goods and services, the consumption goods that the firms are <coughs> producing. And that is a very simple circular flow of money in, in a consumption economy. <coughs> we can complicate the problem in a couple of steps. Step number one, we add in the financial sector and we introduce savings by businesses and households, and we introduce investment spending by firms to pay for capital goods and services that are used in the production process. We complicate it one step further. I'm not gonna go into the details. You can read this on your own. We complicate it a step further by adding the government. The government is very simple flows into and out of the government include government spending on goods and services, also produced by firms, let's say, tax revenues that are collected from the income stream, kind of the money that's taken out of your paycheck that flows to the government, but this is all tax revenues collected by the government, even those from businesses and even from banks. All of the money is sort of um, jumbled together into that one tax term. And then there's transfer payments, the money that governments transfer to households, social security payments being the most prominent one in the United States. Now, the flow into and out of government doesn't have to equal zero, and if in that rare circumstance that the government actually brings in more in tax revenue than it spends and expends in terms of transfers, the government might actually have some saving. 
which would then flow to the financial institutions. Now, more typical is that that flow is in the opposite direction. Financial institutions or people and businesses lend money to the government in order to finance its deficit because government plus transfer payments exceed the tax revenues that are brought in. Okay, so SG can be positive or negative. The last flow we add in, making the diagram as complicated as we can, but actually this is incredibly simple still, is to include the rest of the world, the foreign sector. We've got imports and exports. Remember, the arrows are representing the money flows, not the goods and services flows. So the exports is an arrow in because the money is coming in to buy the goods that are going out. And the import flow is out because the money is going out to buy the goods that are coming in. And if there's any leftover money in the rest of the world, we've just learned that they don't just sit on it. They actually lend it back to somebody in the US economy or buy an asset. So we've got a flow, SF, the foreign savings, that flows into the financial institutions. Now, the twin deficit identity is found <coughs> by basically drawing a ring around the financial institutions and accounting for all of the inflows and outflows. And in essence, it's measuring all of the flows of money absent the consumption flow, which we know is an important flow in the United States. About 70% of the economy is consumption. Take that out of the mix and just keep track of everything else. And we're going to end up with an aggregate identity that looks, uh, let's draw it in big terms. Let's go back to this. That looks like that. <coughs> oh, I forgot to put the little subscript there. SP, private saving. Private saving is the sum of household savings and business savings. Minus I. I is the investment term that comes in the national income identity. C plus I plus G, the I, same I, right there. Investment. Private savings minus investment plus imports minus exports. Imports minus exports is the negative of the current account. And if we take this as a positive number, if imports is greater than exports, then we would say that we have a current account deficit. So one deficit already is apparent here if imports minus exports is a positive number. So positive value for that term means a deficit on current account. Don't get confused by the fact that we often sometimes talk about deficits as a negative value. A negative value here would mean what? Surplus on current account. Okay, so this is the deficit we're reporting here. We can also note that imports minus exports, we can say it's the negative of the current account. We could refer, refer to it as foreign savings or we could refer to it as the balance on the financial account. It's any and all of those things. Now, twin deficit identity says SP minus I plus current account deficit, if it's positive or negative, doesn't matter, is equal to G plus TR minus T. Now, G is government spending, the G from the national income identity. TR is transfer payments, and T is tax revenues. So if G plus TR minus T is a positive number, what would we say the country has? <coughs> yeah, if G plus TR minus T, this last term is positive, what would we say the country has? More than that. We would say it has a government budget deficit. <clears throat> so positive value for this right term means the government's budget is in deficit. More is being spent or expended that is being brought in in the form of tax revenues. And all the national income, I, or this twin deficit identity tells us is that when we add up all these terms and account for them properly, they have to add up in this particular way. Now this term is derived one step previous when you read through the notes. It's derived by summing up the different forms of savings that can flow in and finance investment. There's private savings by households and businesses. There's foreign savings that comes from abroad, and there's government savings in that odd chance that the government actually is saving money. But a better way to think about this twin deficit identity is really that there are basically, in most economies, two sources of funds that are used for two different purposes. The purposes are usually to finance a government budget deficit. Governments have to come up with the money from the financial sector to make that possible. And two, financing private investment. Where do businesses get the money to invest in new equipment 
taken out of the consumption stream. They get it from borrowed funds or from available funds that are in the financial sector. Now, so uses of funds, government, deficits, investment. Sources of funds, twofold. Private savings, domestic residents that tuck their money away, households that put their money into pension plans, for example, or put them in the bank. Businesses that take retained earnings and hold on to money as cash um, in the bank. Those are business savings and household savings, which is available for use to help finance investments in the government budget deficit. And then the second source of funds is foreigners. Foreigners who save their money in the U.S. economy, that SF is positive, and it must mean if SF is positive, balance on financial accounts is positive, we must have a trade, or current account, more specifically, current account deficit. All right, so these numbers have to add up in this particular way. What do they look like for a real economy like the United States? Last year, 2015, it looked like this. Now, first thing I want you to note is that this is arranged in the order of the identity that I just presented. So SP, private savings, minus investment, plus the current account deficit, positive number means deficit, is equal to government budget deficit. Positive number means deficit here on government budget. So we should get 18.4 minus 16.8 is uh, what? Yeah, 1.6. 1.6 uh, plus 2.7. 1.6 plus 2.7 is, oh, it works out to be exactly 4.3. It works perfectly. The numbers add up exactly. Well, the reason they do is because of that little star that's up there. The star by private savings means that when I went out to collect this data and put it all together, I actually found the U.S. value for investment and its GDP. I found the current account deficit and GDP. I found the government budget deficit and GDP. But then I didn't find private savings. I just figured out what number this would have to be <laughs> in order to make it all work. And that gets rid of some of the discrepancies. So if there's any error in the terms, it's in the private savings term. We don't care what the exact values are. Or we just want to get the gist of what the identity can help us understand. All right, so the numbers will all work out nicely because I made it happen. Now, what does this mean? Uses of funds. There are two total uses of funds in this twin deficit identity for the U.S. Government budget needed 4.3% of GDP in order to finance its deficit in 2015. Investment was 16.8% of the economy. Where did the money to finance those two things come from? Well, 18.4% of it came from households and businesses, and 2.7% of GDP came from foreigners who were lending us money and helped us sustain both this investment and the government budget deficit. Now, you could interpret it a little bit differently, and this is playing a little bit loose, but you might say, well, where did the government budget deficit money come from? And you could say, well, more than half of it, actually, came from foreigners. We could think about this being channeled directly in to help finance that government budget deficit. So how do we sustain such a large deficit? Part of it is because as a nation, we're actually borrowing money from the rest of the world. And that could be thought of to kind of help channel and help sus sustain the higher government deficits that the government is actually running. Now normally, we kind of think about private savings being there to help finance private investment. So these two terms together, private savings minus investment, is sometimes thought of as net private savings. The difference between the two is kind of like what, how much savings has been used to finance domestic investment. And what we've got here is that domestic investment can be thought of as being entirely financed out of our private savings that was available. And then there was some extra savings left over. Where did that savings go? Well, to finance the government budget deficit in part as well. So government deficit was financed in part from foreigners and in part from private savers. The rest of that private savings being channeled directly into private investment. Now, the real world is a mixture. You know, so we've got foreigners that are lending money to the government. We've got foreigners that are lending money to firms. We've got private citizens who are lending money to the government. We've got private, it's all a jumble. But when we aggregate it all up, we can interpret it a little bit like this. And that's how we can use this twin deficit identity. Now, look at the changes over time. And note that government budget deficit in the US was quite a bit larger, going back to the 
aftermath of the financial crisis, so it was at 10.7% in 2010. Where did we get the money to do that? Well, in some sense, we were able to finance the higher deficit in part by reducing, <coughs> by suffering from a reduction in investment as a percentage of GDP. Investment fell to 12.5. While savings had risen from 11.7 all the way up to 20% by 2010, private savings went way up, domestic investment went down, and all of those extra private funds, if you will, savings, helped sustain the higher government deficit of 10.7%. We also borrowed 3.2% of our GDP from abroad. Note also, our trade deficit in the US was positive, 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 positive. All the way up to 6.1% back in 2006, <coughs> 2005. So we've had sizable, generally speaking, people will say anything over 5% of GDP is a pretty sizable and maybe worrisome trade deficit, current account deficit. So we had that back in the middle part of the first decade of the 2000s. And go back, notice that the US economy has run a trade deficit in every year since 1992 and even years before that. So trade deficits have been a part of the US picture. Government budget deficits have been very typical as well with the exception of these four years at the end of the Clinton administration when we had surpluses reaching up to 2.4% of GDP. So, one thing to note, twin deficit identity doesn't mean you always have twin deficits. That is just the typical pattern that the U.S. has often followed and that many other countries follow, but it's not the pattern of every country. You can have twin deficits, you can have twin surpluses, or you can have, like we have here, a deficit on trade and a surplus on the government. All of those are possible. Last thing I want to show you is another country. Here's the numbers for China. Does anything look different for China than it does for the United States? What's notably different? Look at the savings and investment numbers in China. Savings at over 50% of national income in all recent years. And you gotta go back to like 2000 to get down to 40% of GDP uh, of savings. Savings is incredibly high all the way back as far as you can see in China. But down to 30% in 1980, all the way up to 50% today. Investment, and by the way, the blue lines here co represent projections by the IMF with the data. So it's not the actual data in these years. But investment up at mid 40s. Very high levels of investment relative to what in the U.S.? 16.5%, right? 16.5, we're looking at 45, 47, 48% in China in recent years. Really, really high levels of investment. Current account deficits are negative. What does that mean? They have trade surpluses. And they have trade surpluses going way back. Does that make China a lending country or a borrowing country, if you put it that way? They're lending money to the rest of the world. By running trade surpluses, they are a lender. They are also a creditor country. If we looked at their IIP, we would see that they are net creditors to the rest of the world. Their budget deficits are kind of insignificant in size and kind of go positive and negative through the years. But the notable difference is the really high savings and investment that China has. And we can come back and we can talk a little bit about the meaning of that in next week's class in particular.